Lord, I'm grateful tonight to be able to be here again with my friends and family, folks here in Meridian. And as always, I acknowledge my need of you. Um, Lord, this is your word. This is your work. And so uh, I'm just here because I've been called to do this. And so I just pray that uh, in spite of me, your word will be clear and your spirit will speak to folks tonight, clarify this subject that we'll be looking at. And so thank you for Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. I don't know if y'all noticed I'm wearing a red shirt tonight. Anybody put two and two together for that? I'm preaching on hell tonight, so I thought a red shirt would be appropriate. So anyway, um, one of the things that people of lots of faiths look forward to is a place that we call, one, one term we use is paradise. Uh, it's that special place of eternal bliss and happiness, and we look forward to it. And, but did you know this, that this morning, uh, people just like you got up in paradise, they took their showers, they ate breakfast, and they went to work. Also... That place that we dread and we hope never to be a part of is, you know, hell. There are people in hell that got up this morning, they brushed their teeth, they took their showers, they ate their breakfast, and they went to work. Do you know that? Talking about Paradise, California, and hell, Michigan. <clears throat> and believe it or not, hell actually froze over. Got this from a, from a website here, frozen over in hell, Michigan. <laughs> anyway... Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about the hell, the hell that most people have grown up fearing, as I'll talk about a little bit later in the message tonight, the place where we say that bad people go, a place where the sinners burn in eternal flames, a place where we're told that is presided over by none other than the devil himself. Uh, now, Wednesday night, we looked at the topic about what happens when you die, the mystery of death, and we found that Jesus compares death to what? Sleep, we saw that very clearly from, from John chapter 11 and, and 53 other places, and I uh, actually went through several of them from the concordance there, but it, the Bible compares death to sleep um, 53 times, in fact, it says it, specifically in the King James Version. And, but the, 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 you know, the, the point is that we sleep until the resurrection. That means we're simply in the grave. As we looked at that verse a minute ago from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, you know, that, you know when we die, our body just goes back to the earth, and we are kind of we're cease to exist until Jesus puts us back together again at the resurrection. So we're just sleeping in, in this unconscious sleep awaiting the resurrection. Uh, but that's what happens to the righteous. But what about the wicked? What about the folks who reject the gift of the cross and they choose instead to follow Satan instead of Jesus uh, you know, over the years, I've heard a lot of theories, as I'm sure you have, about what happens, uh, uh, and there's books out there on the subject of hell, and sometimes, because there's so many ideas, you have to wonder, well, what really does the Bible teach about this? And so, I want to share with you from a book called The Sight of Hell, and by the way, this is a book, I, I looked it up this afternoon on the internet, this is, I'm quoting off the Amazon description this afternoon, it said, The Sight of Hell was written for children and young persons in 1861 by the Reverend John, and his last name is Furnace, no pun intended, that's his real name. And this, notice what he says in his book, this is for, young, for children and young persons, it says, look into this little prison, in the middle of it there's a boy, a young man, he is silent, despair is on him, he stands straight up, his eyes are burning like two burning coals, two long flames come out of his ears, his breathing is difficult, sometimes he opens his mouth and a breath of blazing fire rolls out of it. But listen, it says, there's a sound just like that of a kettle boiling. Is it really a kettle boiling? No. Then what is it? The blood is boiling in the scalded veins of that boy. The brain is boiling and bubbling in his head. The marrow is boiling in his bones. This is a book for children and young people. Can you imagine this being a bedtime story before you put them to bed at night? So let me ask you a question. When you read something like this, uh, is this really what God, you think, does to unrepentant sinners? Is this an accurate description? But it is what some Christians have been preaching for years and years and years. And it is what, I don't know if you ever heard of Robert Ingersoll. His father was a preacher, and his father preached these same sort of sermons. Of it. He was a well-known atheist of his day. He's kind of like the, the Richard Dawkins of today. And he spent his entire life fighting Christianity 
But what some people don't realize is, like I said, his father was a preacher. And he often heard his father preach about the kind of hell that I was just reading about from this children's book. A hell that's unending, unimaginable torture for those who are consigned there for the rest of eternity. And the more Robert Ingersoll thought about this and thought about this this God who was like this, he thought to himself, if that's what God's like, then I don't want anything to do with it. And he spent the rest of his life fighting against the God of the Bible. Um, today, you know, more modern folks, like I said, there's Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Stephen Hawking's, but they do the same thing. And at some point, almost inevitably, every one of them, when you read about them, the critics come back to the subject of hell. And they all have been asking the same exact question, how can a good God do such a horrible thing? I think it's a fair question. Uh, how can you reconcile those two ideas, a God who is love, a God who would give his son to die for us, and a God who would punish someone with unimaginable tortures throughout all of eternity? What does the Bible say? Is hell going to be the way the books and the movies describe it? Does it really work the way that we see in cartoons where the devil is this red person with a pitchfork and tail and kind of in charge of hellfire? You know, you hear so much stuff about hell and these other topics that it sometimes gets hard to to differentiate what's real or what's true and what's false. And so I want to look at what the Bible says. I want to begin with some facts that we know for sure that the Bible teaches about hell. The first thing I want to look at is hell is a real place. It certainly is a real place. No question about it. Look with me. Revelation 20, verse 15 says this, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that's the tragic truth. There are some people who won't be in heaven. That's just the way it is. Uh, Because they don't want to be there is a key thing to understand. If you don't want to be there, God's not going to make you be there, right? God's not going to force anyone into heaven. So... uh, The alternative is the lake of fire. Now, here's here's another fact. The Bible teaches that hellfire was never intended for human beings. Not one human being was ever supposed to be in the lake of fire. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Jesus said that. Notice Matthew 25, verse 41. It says, "Then uh, uh, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for who? The devil and his angels. God never meant the fires of hell for human beings. It was prepared, as the scriptures say, for the devil and his angels. And if you've been with me through the first you know, eight, nine sermons here in this series, you begin to understand the picture is probably a little clearer. But the problem is that we, is that the human race, we seem determined to follow the dragon. You remember this worldwide, uh, the whole world, it says, is going to wonder and follow after this beast power in Revelation chapter 13. And if you follow the dragon, you're eventually going to end up where the dragon goes and where the beast power goes, as we'll see also a little later on. So, anyway, hell is real. It's not intended for humans. And the third thing I want to notice is hellfire is not burning right now. It hasn't started yet. And you think, well, I thought, you know, it's it's already going on down there somewhere, wherever it might be. There's a story that was ran by some tabloids that I looked up and spent some time reading about this afternoon. It was even, it was in some of the tabloids, things that you would expect to find stories like this, but also it was on Trinity Broadcasting Network back in the late 80s. They said that a team of of Soviet engineers, they were drilling this hole, and I forgot what the hole was for, but they were in Siberia, and they drilled nine miles down into the earth, and they broke into what they claimed was hell. They said they even put a microphone down there and they could hear the tormented souls of the damned down there. Of course, it all turned out to be false and they figured out what all of those things were. But that's where you find sources like National Enquirer, but that's not what the Bible says. According to the scripture, hellfire is not burning yet. Listen very carefully to the words of Jesus. This is a parable he tells about the end of the world. And I want to read through the whole thing here. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. It's page 673 in those Bibles I have there for you. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24, <clears throat> says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, 
But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Verse 27, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So that's the story. This is the story that Jesus tells, but what does it mean? Well, it's easy to figure out what it means because the disciples had the same question in their minds, and they asked Jesus about it, and he begins to explain to them in verse 37. Picking up in verse 37, he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. So he says, I'm the one who's sowing the good seed. He says, The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So this is a story about the second coming of Jesus. And this book of Revelation actually calls it this return a harvest. And we'll look at that maybe on another night. And it's a harvest that when Jesus returns and all those angels come with him. It's to gather up a harvest and to gather up all the believers at that time. Continues on now in verse 40, Matthew 13. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age... The Son of the Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Notice that, verse, that text again. And we will, cast, excuse me, we will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So listen to the words of Jesus. He says the furnace burns after the second coming, after the harvest takes place. You and I are going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, it says, but the wicked are gathered and, and burned in the fire. And so it's very real. Hell is very real. But here's what I want you to think about. If the fire burns after the end of the world, that means how many people are burning in hellfire right now? Zero. So here's what we know so far. Hell is real. We see that very clearly. It wasn't intended for human beings. Um, it hasn't started burning yet. And we just noticed it burns at the end of the age or after the second coming of Jesus. And so those are some things that we know for sure very clearly from the scriptures. But still there's other questions like, where does it burn? You know, we've, we've wondered, you know, like those, those Russians, they claim they found hell down in the middle of the earth somewhere, right? And you hear these different things. Maybe it's located in some far corner of the universe. But what does the Bible teach? Look in Revelation chapter 20 with me, verses 7 through 9. And this, this subject, by the way, we're going to look at next uh, Saturday morning. It says, now when the thousand years have expired, again, Saturday morning, the, this thousand year subject we're going to spend. And I, by the way, I may change the subject from Friday night to Saturday morning. I may swap those around, but I'll let you know. But uh, it will bring everything we've been studying together when we look at this topic, the thousand years. Anyway, it says, um, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. We'll see exactly what that means. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up, so this is all these wicked people, it says they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And notice what the Bible says happens next. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The Bible is really very clear. Hellfire burns on the face of this earth. That's where it says on the earth is where they gather around the city to try and take it. And again, we'll talk more about that next week. But God sends fire and they're destroyed at that point. So hell burns on this earth. Another question that sometimes people come to mind, well, why, why hell? Why does God use hell? Why does he use fire? Well, probably for the same reason that police use fire to get rid of a, like a marijuana plantation. They burn it up because they want it gone, right? That's why the police burn marijuana, right? They want it gone? Anyway, I hope that's why they do it. But, but fire is a permanent solution, is it not? Uh, if you bury somebody, you know, somebody could dig them up or something. You could dig it up. If you throw something into the water, it could come up. Uh, if you, but if you burn something... It's gone, and you, you, it's consumed, right? 
God is using a permanent solution to sin and sinners. He's going to eliminate pain and suffering forever, as we've looked at before and we'll look at again tonight. But everything that has been tainted by sin is going to be eliminated. Who wants to keep living in a world where we still have sin and pain and all that, right? That's the purpose of this whole thing, is to get rid of it. So let me show you what the Bible says God is planning to accomplish. Revelation 21, verse 4. Here's the promise I alluded to a minute ago. It says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So when is God going to do that? When's he, he's going to, to put this permanent end to misery. He's going to stop sin in his tracks. No more pain, suffering, death at the end of the age when he sends fire. And we're going to come back to this in a minute, but it raises another question. How long will hellfire burn? Uh, you know, we're told uh, by, uh, as kids that hell's going to burn forever and ever and ever, right? When I was seven years old, you know, I, I've told you, y'all knew, most of you know I was raised here in Meridian. I took some pictures of the church where I used to attend when I was a kid. I went around taking pictures of places a couple weeks ago, and I took a picture of this place where I was baptized when I was seven years old. But that morning, that Sunday morning, the preacher was preaching about hellfire, and he preached a, a fire kind of like that storybook we were reading from a minute ago. And I was absolutely terrified when I left church that Sunday morning. And I told my mom that afternoon, I said, I need to be baptized. I don't, you know, I don't want to go to hell. And she said, you're too young to be baptized. And so uh, she said, but I'll let you talk to the preacher. So I met with the preacher told the preacher how scared I was of hell. I didn't want to go to hell. So he and my mom finally agreed for me to be baptized. And I was baptized at, at seven years old. But you know why I was baptized? Because I was scared of hell. I didn't care about Jesus. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I just didn't want to go to hell. That was my reason for being baptized the first time. That's called a fire escape religion. There's no love for Jesus. It's just a matter of, hey, I, I'm afraid of hell. And by the way, that won't get you to heaven, that kind of baptism. But if it's true that people burn forever and ever, would suffering really be eliminated? When Jesus says, I'm going to wipe it away. If there's someone excruci in excruciating agony somewhere in the, in the universe, or will it be on the earth still, as we saw, how would pain be eliminated? Listen carefully again to the scriptures. Fire come down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Let me ask you a question. What does devour mean? I, I love Mexican food. It's a fact. Um, it's, and the other day, on Thursday, yesterday, uh, the pastor took me out to eat to a little Mexican restaurant I'd never been before. And we ordered our food, and we got there, and I devoured it. That's what It was gone. I ate every bite of it. And I ate it before he was halfway done with his. And maybe he had more food or meat than something, but, but that's what devouring is. It's absolutely, completely gone. The fire devours the wicked, and then it goes out. The, bi the fire's not going to burn forever and ever. It, 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 it puts itself out. Look at this from the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. Now, what is stubble? It's not the stuff on your chin. What's stubble? What's it referring to here, I should say? The short, little, stubby, dry grass, right? After the crops, they'd, they'd you know, chop down all the crops. They were left with that little stubby nubs. They would burn it up, and it would be completely destroyed. The verse continues. We didn't read it all. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. It will leave them neither root nor branch. He says, nothing will be left when hellfire does its work. There will be nothing left. It doesn't go on and on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Listen to the rest of the passage, verse 3. Malachi 4, verse 3 says, You will trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord. God says the wicked will become ashes. The fire burns them. It destroys them. The fire burns out. And, and it's not saying we'll really be stomping around on the wicked. It's, the point is they will be completely gone into ashes. That's the point that the Scripture is making here. And you can read the Bible over and over again and again. You'll find this text after text after text. Here's another one from Psalm chapter 21, verse 9 and 10. 
says, you make them as a fiery oven. He's talking about the wicked. You make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring uh, you shall destroy from the earth. Their descendants from among the sons of men. So the wicked are destroyed from the earth. And when this world is over, it's time for the kingdom of Christ. And God has gotten rid of everything that's wicked. Everything will be gone that's wrong and wicked. He's not going to torture people. He's actually bringing a permanent end to all pain and suffering. Another text, Psalm 37, verse 20. Again, I've got a, I hope you always know I've got a whole host of more texts I could share that I don't share. Psalm 37, 20. But the wicked shall perish, the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. Boom, they're just burned up. Here's another one. <clears throat> Psalm 145, 20. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And I want to stop for a minute and kind of think this through. You know, a lot of us, I don't know if all of us are or not, but most of us here are our parents. And let's just say that your child has a messy room. you still got a kid that's young enough to be in the house. Mine are not that age anymore. But you've got a kid in their room, and they make this mess, and it's always a mess. And you go in, you say, hey, I want this room cleaned up. I want you to get this done. And so you walk out of the room. You go away, you come back in an hour, the room's no better. It doesn't look like anything has changed. You say, I told you to clean that room up. This is your last chance. I'm going to be back in 30 minutes. And if this room isn't clean, you're going to get it. You wait about 30 minutes. You go back into the room. Of course, when you open the door, the room is still a mess. So you blow your stack. And since there are 11 toys left on the floor, you spank your child one hour for every toy, 11 hours. Does that make sense? course not so tell me uh, obviously a good parent wouldn't do anything so ridiculous as that why would we think that our heavenly father would do that the truth is this is another one of those things you know we looked at from night number uh two how satan started this this campaign if you will in heaven we saw that in isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, how Satan started this campaign in heaven trying to turn the angels. As we know, he was successful. Revelation 12 tells us one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven with Lucifer. They went along with it. And so this is all a part of the program where Satan, if he can do anything to turn people away from God, and there's been so many atheists who have been made that way, like Robert Ingersoll and some of these others, because of this doctrine of an eternal hellfire. Without any relief. Um, God is not going to torture people forever. The Bible says the fire burns out. It comes to an end. And Satan wants the world to think that God is this merciless, I hate to use the word monster. I had somebody say, oh, you, I, you, you don't believe in hellfire. On the contrary, I believe in a hellfire that's hotter than your hellfire. Because the hellfire I believe in does the job. It gets rid of all the wicked. It doesn't leave any more in the universe. Um, this is probably one of, the, one of the most talked about subjects in the Bible. And you're going to find this story again and again. I want to look at Isaiah 47. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 14. It says, Behold, they shall be a stubble. It's talking about the wicked again. They shall be a stubble, just like we saw from Malachi 4. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. And people say, oh, there we go. They're burning forever. No, it says they can't deliver themselves. They can't save, rescue themselves from the flame. They, uh, it's not, it shall not be a coal to be worn by, nor a fire to sit before. What it's saying is this is not just a casual campfire. This is a fire so hot it completely devours everything. The wicked are stubble, and then the fire goes out, and there's nothing left there. There's not a coal left to warm by, it says. It consumes all the wicked, and then it's gone. It's completely thorough. In fact, it's so thorough that the devil himself is destroyed. You know, what really bothers, I think, some people is they think, well, if humans are punished, but the devil, he, he just gets to keep prodding them and doing his thing throughout eternity. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Look, let's go back to Ezekiel 28. We were there on night number two, <clears throat> Ezekiel 28. As we saw, we won't take the time to get into the, all the context, but we know this is, was talking to Lucifer, the covering cherub, Satan, uh, the devil. 
He says, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. We talked about what that meant. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought a fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you into ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and you shall be no more. How long? Forever. Satan is going to be wiped out forever. Remember we saw Jesus said the fire, the hellfire was, was made for the devil and his angels. Everything goes. All wickedness is destroyed, including the devil. Satan doesn't work for God. He doesn't get to live forever torturing people in the fires of hell. The Bible says that Satan will be destroyed as well. You know, it's, it's, it's tragic for so many years that we have this idea of, of God that sometimes we have. I don't know if you've heard of uh, a famous preacher. His name is Jonathan Edwards. He was a good preacher, a godly man. He was back from those older days as well. But he's best known for a sermon he preached. And look it up on the internet. It's called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. He preached this sermon in 1741. And this is, this is just a reflection of the theology of his day. And even the theology of that preacher that scared me into baptism when I was seven years old. And this is what he said. The view of the, this is quoting a sermon he preached. The view of the wicked being tormented in hell will be a font of happiness for the saints throughout eternity. It will make paradise even more precious to them when they see their loved ones suffering in that way. The saints won't have any compassion for the wicked in hellfire. As they suffer inexplicable pain, it will give them happiness to see them burn there. Now, let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, is that true? Can you picture the angels of heaven gathering everybody up, you know, in, in a place like this and rolling back the curtains on a Saturday to let us be entertained by people being tortured? Here's another example. I found this one today, actually, a guy named Samuel Hopkins. I actually found two more. It says, he said this, um, the dis this display of divine ca character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed and most entertaining and give the highest pleasure to those who love God. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would in great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. That doesn't make sense, does it? I've got several more, but I'm just going to give you one more here on the screen. <clears throat> This is one, again, I found today. Thomas Aquinas, many of you might have heard of him, an early church father, so to speak. He said this, In order that the happiness of the saints may be more delightful to them, and that they may render more copious thanks to God for it, they are allowed to see perfectly the sufferings of the damned. The elect will go out by seeing manifestly, so that they may be urged the more to praise God. The saints in heaven know distinctly all that happens to the damned. Now, would any of us here be able to say there's some way you could find some enjoyment in that? I hope not. The Bible says that God himself does not delight in the death of the wicked. Do you think it'll be a pleasure for God to see people who he gave his son for be destroyed? Ezekiel 33 verse 11 says this, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. God says, I don't have any, I don't, I'm going to have any pleasure when the wicked die. He says, I want you to turn. I want you to turn from your wickedness. So why would anybody say we're going to enjoy it? When you read the Bible carefully, you start to discover that's the most difficult thing that God will ever have to do, and that is destroy the wicked. Because he's done everything at that point, as we've talked about on several nights. God will have done everything in your life, in my life, to try and woo you to him, to surrender your heart to him. He will have done everything possible. So you finally come to that place where it's it just, it is what it is. It's also called God's strange act or his unusual act. Notice Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21. It says, for the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. It's very unusual. You know, this isn't something that God wants to do. You know, you and I and human beings, we're the ones that made the mess here, but God doesn't leave it for someone else to clean it up. 
He went to the cross to, for, for salvation for you and I. In the end, he personally has to handle the final cleanup. Now, I know you may have some questions. Well, what about all those passages that say forever and ever and et cetera? We're going to look at a couple of those. I don't have time to go through every question, but if you have some more at the end, you can put it in the box and we'll catch it the next, next session tomorrow night or tomorrow morning. Um, But there are four words that are usually translated hell in the Bible. This will help us understand this question I just asked. And these four words is the word sheol. That's in the Old Testament. And that's basically the only word that's used in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word sheol. And it's simply, it's translated in 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 many of our versions, especially the King James Version. It's translated, the Hebrew says sheol, but they translate the word hell. And what it means is the grave. That's what sheol means. It doesn't mean some place of burning forever. Sheol is the Hebrew word for grave. Uh, you know, the Bible says, if you remember when Job was suffering, he says, you know, I wish I could die and go to Sheol, the Bible says in Job. He's not saying, I wish I could go burn forever. He's just saying, I wish I could be dead. That's all, that was his point. He wasn't saying, I want to be, you know, he said, my, ba- my life is so bad, I wish I could just go to the grave and be done with this. In the New Testament, that second word you see there is the word Gehenna. It's basically a garbage dump, and it has a root word that we won't take time to get into, uh, but it's translated hell sometimes as well. But Gehenna was, was basically a garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem, and it was a place where they kept the fire burning all the time, and this is how we associate it. They kept the fire burning there, and the people, you know, today we have these places where we take our, you know, the trash men come and, and pick up our trash bins, and they go take care of it. We don't have to fool with it mostly. But back then, they had to have to do something with their trash, and so they would take their, their refuge, this place of burning, and it would all be d- destroyed, consumed there in Gehenna, the fires of Gehenna. And so that's how we get this idea of this burning fire. They took bodies of animals, sometimes of criminals, but nobody was tortured there. It was like an ancient incinerator, if you would. There's the word Hades, which also means uh, the grave. It's the Greek, this is the Greek, Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus are Greek words, and Hades is a Greek word that basically, basically means the grave again. It's the equivalent of the, of the Hebrew word Sheol, the grave. In Second Peter, so it's the same thing there. We, we may read in, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, New Testament may say, Hades, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Hades, but we'll translate it as hell. But we have in our mind this idea, well, when it says hell, it's talking about this place that's burning forever and ever and ever. That's not what it's saying. Um, The other word, Tartarus, it only appears one time in the scriptures as I see, as I point on the screen, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and it's kind of, it refers uh, refers to the place where uh, fallen angels are waiting for judgment. And we'll talk more about that in that last session when we look at Revelation chapter 20. But those are the words used for hell. Now let's go back to the Bible and get some more information about some of these things we've been talking about. Back Now we're looking at Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and 44. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you enter, to enter life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell. Now, the word hell here, and, and if, you, if you have that concordance that some of you have been winning, we've been giving them out every night, you can look up the word hell, and you'll find out this is the word Gehenna. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about some eternal burning flame in the middle of the earth or wherever people think hell is. It's simply saying, you know, it's better to, 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 have you, to chop your hand off. And it goes on. Notice how the rest, I don't want to read the rest of the verse now. It says, into the fire that shall never be quenched, notice that, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And people think, aha, gotcha. There's the text. Hell will never be quenched. Hell will never go out. It means it burns forever and ever and ever and ever. But let me ask you, is that what it's saying? The word Gehenna is the garbage dump. There's this big fire, as I mentioned. And so the point is, it couldn't be put out. You couldn't take a few buckets of water and douse the flame out. The fire is unquenchable. That's the point. Many of you know, I lived in Tombsuba, Mississippi, many years ago. And we uh, got a piece of property, my wife and I, and I began to clear it off. I'd work during the day, and the afternoon when I get off, I had an axe, and, and we'd take an axe, and i chop that stuff down. i chop the trees down. i chop the brush down. And there was a, a, a big hill 
and over and it kind of dropped off to like a little sand pit down below it. And so I was clearing all that by hand, and when I, when I would ch chop down the trees, I would drag them, I'd push them over that hill. And so I kept doing that until I finally had enough land cleared for the driveway and for the, for the mobile home and all that. And, but you can imagine this huge pile of wood was, was piling up this whole time. And the bank was probably, <clears throat> I rode by there, by the way, last week, just because you know you, how your man, you have these pictures of things. I want to see what it really looked like now. And it's all grown up. But, but I could see, it. you know, the hill was probably about 10 feet above where that sand pit was. So the, the home and stuff was, was back here. And like, say, this was the hill. And there's about a 10-foot drop, and all that stuff was piling up. The pile had gotten higher than, than the bank here now. And so one night, some friends of mine, uh, a, a friend of mine and, and his girlfriend and my wife and I, we were there, and it was summer, and we decided, to, hey, I, I decided, I should say, I'm going to build a fire. And so we thought we'd, we'd burn up. This is a good time to start burning that pile of brush. And so, you know, I did what any good redneck would do. I took me some gasoline. I doused it over there over the top of that hill, over the, all that brush that was all dried out in the middle of the summer and just dry as a bone, but I added some gas. And then we took a, a match, and I thank the Lord that I stood back. I was smart enough, in spite of uh, what was going on, I stood back and I thumped the match like you can do off the matchbox. And it flew over, and when it hit that pile of, of dried wood with gasoline on it, it was like an explosion. It went kawoom! And there was a big pine tree that stood on the edge of that bank. I'd say the diameter was about this big, about two and a half foot uh, diameter. And it went up into the sky there, and it was probably 15, 20 foot above that bank before the first limb stuck out. That fire shot up so high, it caught that pine tree on fire. And so it was like this torch burning in my yard. And I was too embarrassed. I was intoxicated. I didn't want to call the fire department. And so my friend <clears throat> that was with me there, the, hose, the water hose, of course, wouldn't reach, but about to halfway to the bank. So we started filling up buckets of water, and we were running over there trying to put this fire out. And we did everything we could, but you know what? We couldn't put that fire out. It was totally unquenchable. But guess what? It went out. When it burned up the wood, the flame went out. We couldn't quench it. It was unquenchable to us, and that's the point the Bible is making here. That's exactly, when the Bible says unquenchable fire, it's simply a fire that's too big and too hot for human beings to extinguish. You now you can bring in all the fire trucks in the world, but you wouldn't be able to put that fire out until it finishes its job. Let me show you, in the book of Jeremiah, God told Israel, he, he, through the prophet Jeremiah, he says, Nebuchadnezzar the king is going to come, he's going to destroy this city. And notice how he words this in Jeremiah 17, verse 27. <clears throat> He says, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, talking about Jerusalem. God is saying he's going to do that through, through uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, and the nation of Babylon. It shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be what? Quenched. Now let me ask you a question. Is Jerusalem still burning right now with that unquenchable fire? No, of course not. The Bible says it was burned with unquenchable fire, but it's because the people of Jerusalem, they couldn't do anything to put it out. It did its job. And then it went out. The city burned, the fire went out. Look at another passage some people find confusing. When we look at it, actually already, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Matthew 25, verse 40, 41. It says, <clears throat> Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And you read the word everlasting here, and that throws us off. But again, the point is always to let the Bible explain itself. Listen very carefully to what the Bible says happens to Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude chapter 1 verse 7 says this. It says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. The Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah are, are an example of what happens with eternal fire. Let me ask you the same question I asked you about Jerusalem. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning tonight? No, that would be impossible. The, the, the ancient location of Sodom and Gomorrah is actually under where the Dead Sea is now. 
So why does the Bible say it would burn with eternal fire? Because the results are permanent. The results are eternal. Those cities are gone forever. Nobody's going to ever bring them back. The fires of hell are eternal because it's a permanent solution. Once it does its job, it's done. Look at another tricky passage. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast... And so this is the end of all those who follow the beast and the beast power. Where the brim, uh, fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now there it is again. You say, well, there will be tortured forever. It's going to go on and on and on through the ceaseless ages of eternity. But again... The Bible, that's not quite what it's saying. When you come across the, this concept of forever in the Bible, it, it's more of a relative term, and I'll, I'll let the Bible explain itself. But forever is an, an adjective that's limited by the subject that it's describing. <clears throat> How long forever is depends on what you're talking about. It's kind of a way of saying that something will last as long as it lasts. So when God says, when the Scriptures talk about God living forever, that means forever, because God always has been, God always will be, so it means immortal, right? We talked about the difference in immortal and mortality uh, on Wednesday night. Right now, you and I are mortal, and it means as long as we live, we are subject to death. Let me show you an example from the scriptures, and there's a couple of them we could look at, but we're just going to look at this one quickly. If you remember the story of Hannah, you remember Hannah wanted a, a little boy, and the Bible says she prayed, and God answered her prayer. And so Hannah was so thankful that she received the, the little boy Samuel. She said this, But Hannah didn't go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there. How long? So Hannah said that, that Samuel, when her son was weaned, when he was a little older, she was going to take him to the temple, and he, she, he was going to serve forever. Is Samuel still in the temple tonight? No, he's not. The Bible says he died. Um, in fact, <clears throat> we know that that temple that it was referred to is gone as well. Let's let it, the Bible explain itself. Hannah explains it here in verse 28. <clears throat> Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. Forever, as I said before, is dependent on the subject for which it is describing. Here, it means until Samuel forever meant as long as Samuel lived or as long as something lasts. It's a way of saying that something is going to run its whole course. Nobody's going to interfere with it till it's done. One more quick example, Jonah. Jonah chapter 2, you know, he was swallowed by the big fish. We always say it's a whale. We don't really know. The Bible didn't say that. We know it was a big fish. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, <clears throat> Jonah's describing his experience in the belly of this great fish. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me. How long? Forever. How long was Jonah in the belly of this great fish? The Bible tells us three days, right? And so forever, it might have seemed like forever to him, but the experience only lasted till it came to an end. That's what it's saying here. Look at this, U.S. News and World Report. It says, hell, a pagan doctrine, quoted uh, a, a theologian named Hughes. He says, in, in, uh, he says this, And Hughes argues that the traditional belief in unending punishment is linked to the erroneous belief in the innate Im immortality of the soul. And we talked about that the other night. Uh, a belief, he says, that is based more on Plato and, and Babylon, I would say, than on the Bible. The immortality of which the Christian is assured is not inherent in himself or in his soul, but is bestowed by God. We saw that the other night. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and following there, it says when Jesus comes, then we, this mortal must put on immortality. It is that point where we receive eternal life. But at this point, we are mortal. We are subject to death. I don't know if you guys or any of you ever heard of a, a movie that came out a few years ago. It was called Hell and Mr. Fudge. Um, anyway, it, I went online to find out about this, <clears throat> this movie. And I want to read kind of a, a, this is a description from, from the website of this movie that kind of describes this movie. It says, an eccentric stranger wants to hire Edward Fudge for a bizarre project. 
He wants Fudge to investigate hell. Edward Fudge is a small-town Bible Belt preacher. And this is a true story, by the way. This is not a fiction. This is true. A uh, Bible Belt preacher, son of a respected church leader known for his conservative religious views, Edward is confident that whatever the Bible really teaches is right. Trained in biblical languages and theology, he finds the project intriguing. He agrees to take it on, not knowing where it will leave. He dedicates a year of his life to a systematic study of hell. Can you imagine that? Just a, a year just studying hell. And his life, it says, would never be the same again. And it goes on. His own congregation, the people he loves and serves, fires him. The publishing company he has worked for, worked for since childhood terminates his employment because he refuses to recant his positions. Ultimately, it says... Fudge emerges as a defender of faith in Scripture and a champion, champion for God's love. Now, you end up writing a very thorough book on this. In fact, it's about this thick. I had one. I don't know what happened to it. I can't find it. I probably loaned it to somebody. But anyway, he wrote this book called The Fire That Consumes. And it's a study on hell and eternal torment. And it stands as a testimony, and I'm going to quote again, it stands as a testimony to a man who had the courage to search for truth and to pay the price for what it found, what he found. Now, I want to read a couple of quotes I'll share with you on the screen from his book. He says, Not one time in all of Scripture does God say that any human being will be made immortal for the purpose of suffering conscious everlasting punishment. That is key to understand there. God doesn't give us eternal life so he, just so he, make us live forever just so He can torture us. He goes on, he says, we were raised on the traditionalist view. We accepted it because it was said to rest on the Bible. This closer investigation of the scriptures indicates that we were mistaken in that assumption. A careful look discovers that both the Old and New Testaments teach instead a resurrection of the wicked for the purpose of divine judgment, the fearful anticipation of a consuming fire, irrevocable expulsion from God's presence, and finally... The total everlasting extinction of the wicked with no hope of resurrection, restoration, or recovery. Now we stand on that on the authority of the Word of God. He is not the only evangelical Christian who's been studying this and coming to these same conclusions. Uh, a book called Ministry Magazine, or magazine <clears throat> called Ministry, uh, said this, and I'm quoting it again. I went on the online version. It says, In conservative circles, there's a seeming reluctance to espouse publicly a doctrine of hell. And where it's hell, there's a seeming tendency towards a doctrine of hell as annihilation. That means total eradication. Conditional immortality. In other words, your immortality is, is based on, how, you know, on God. It appears to be gaining acceptance in evangelical orthodox circles. It goes on to say this. <clears throat> These scholars who support the Bible and reject the more liberal interpretations of Scripture have stated that they don't believe the more traditional views about hell. Most of them confess a belief in a punishment for the wicked that ends in annihilation. He says also, there's increasing evidence that many evangelical Christians involving a variety of denominations are moving towards conditionalism. Conditionalism or annihilationism. That's the same, talking about the same thing, that the wicked are completely eradicated. They're not left to suffer forever and ever and ever. Here's a new quote I found today, a book called Rethinking Hell, <clears throat> promoting the same thing. It says, most evangelical Christians believe that those people who are not saved before they die will be punished in hell forever. But is this what the Bible truly teaches? Do Christians need to rethink their understanding of hell? It says, in the late 20th century, a growing number of of evangelical theologians, biblical scholars, and philosophers began to reject the traditional doctrine of eternal conscious torment in hell in favor of a, a minority theological perspective called conditional immortality. He's saying more and more people are starting to see this is what the Bible really says. It doesn't teach God is going to torture you or anyone forever and ever and ever. So the reason I share some of those quotes is so I don't want you to think this is some, just some idea that I've come up with in my basement or this is just some idea that my church come up with. No, this, this is what the church always taught until fairly recently. Um, 
And more and more denominations and people from different churches are studying their Bibles and they're finding out that God completely destroys the wicked. They see that this view is in line with the character of a God that loves us enough to give himself for us. Doesn't that make sense? And I will say this, even if it didn't make sense, if the Bible really taught hell burns forever and man will be tortured forever and ever and ever, I'd be okay with that. You know why? Because God is God. He can do what He wants to do. He made me. He redeemed me. He, he has the right to destroy me however He chooses to do so, right? I believe that completely. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And, it, and the Bible doesn't contradict it. It wouldn't say God is a God of love and then say God's a God of love, but, but He'll torture you forever if you don't go along with His plan. Doesn't make sense. Um, we'll look at another phrase that's used that people wonder about. And it'll help put some more of these pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, it will definitely help you when we come to our last session when we talk about those, this thousand years. It's a phrase, second death. What is that? What does it mean? Well, it's used four times in the Bible, the, the, the phrase second death. Revelation 20, verse 14 is the first one. It says, Then death and Hades were cast into the fire. This is the second death. So what is the second death? Let's look at the other three places it's used first. Revelation 2, verse 11 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. By the way, do you know the Bible talks about two resurrections? Um, next Saturday morning or when we cover this thousand years, make sure you're here. We're going to see something very interesting in what the Bible teaches. But it goes on, Over such the second death has no power. Revelation 21, verse 8, says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the what? Second death. The second death simply is this. It is the death from which there is no resurrection. So what that means, if you are born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. You see what I mean? If, you, if you're born once, if you don't, if you're, you, we're all, we've all, everyone here has been born, right? <laughs> we've all been born. We've had the first birth. If you haven't been born again with a, with a rebirth through the Holy Spirit, if you haven't done that, you will have the second death from which there will be no resurrection. But if you've been born twice, you won't have to have that second death. Now, you may go into the grave before then. But when Jesus comes, we'll be resurrected. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, so, the first death is that death that we will all experience if Jesus doesn't come first. It's just that natural death. The second death is that eternal death, one from which there is no resurrection. It's that eternal separation from God. It's what happens when the God sends that fire to devour the wicked. They're gone forever. When they're burned up, it's gone. All wickedness is destroyed, eradicated, annihilated, never to be again. So let's put some of the information together we've been looking at. Hell is, is not some just burning spot in the center of the earth. It's the final, complete annihilation of the wicked, the destruction of the wicked. That's what hell is. And so think about this carefully. This is probably the most well-known text I bet, I bet, I would almost, I don't want to bet, I'm not a betting man, but I believe that every one of you could quote this text, John chapter 3, verse 16. And look at this text and see what it says. For God, I, I almost tempted to have you read it with me, but I'll read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are two options in this verse. Do you see that? You either perish or you have everlasting life. There's no mention about people getting tortured forever. It's either eternal life with God or death, the second death. It's very clear. Um, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 20 says this, For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out, destroyed. 1 John 5, 3, I didn't have time to make a slide for this. It says, he who has the Son has what? Life. 
1 John 5, 3, verse 13, 14, right in there. It says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You have life in Jesus or you have eternal death. There's no life in heaven or eternal torture in hell. It's life or death. It's very clear. No other options. Again, Revelation 21, verse 4. God said, Scriptures say, uh, no more suffering, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. How could there be people suffering forever in hell? This text couldn't be true. If someone's being tortured throughout eternity, there'll be no more pain or suffering. God's going to wipe it out. That's the beauty of hell. Um, in fact, God promises in Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, He says, affliction shall not rise up a second time. And what that means is once God, this whole plan, we've been talking about this, this great controversy. You know, hopefully the pieces are coming together for you as we look at this night after night. Um, This whole great controversy has been this whole thing to to prove the goodness of God. And this will finally, once, once God, the wicked is revealed, you know, as we saw from 1 Corinthians 4, this world is a spectacle. To the, to the angels. It's a spectacle. We're, they're, they're watching. People were watching to see what happens. You follow God or you follow the Satan. This is the end result. We're living in a world that's following Satan. We see how terrible it is. We see how this, this world has become so wicked. And finally, though, there's going to be a day where God is going to, it's all going to culminate. And we're going to talk more about this. You need to be here the next few nights as we talk about how this begins to, to build up, starting again Well, tomorrow morning, but tomorrow night for sure. And then Sunday night, when we look at the mark of the beast on Sunday night. But all this builds up. And finally, there comes the place where God mercifully eradicates all wicked, all evil, all sin. And affliction will never rise up again. Never again will planet Earth be contaminated with sin. But there's even more good news because, again, this is all about the throne of God. The devil has been trying to convince the human race that God shouldn't rule the universe. He should have his place. Remember, we saw that very clearly. He paints this horrific picture of God trying to convince any man, any person, any way that he can to turn from God, reject God. And this is one of the ways he's been doing that successfully. And God has given the devil enough space to prove that he is a murderer and he's a liar. And so the cross proves it all. The cross proves the true love of God and it showed the true character of Satan that he would put the Son of God to death. And so right now, the Bible says that God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but at some moment that we're building up very closely to, I believe, you saw with me in the first couple of sessions here, God's finally going to reach the limits of his patience. It's all going to come to an end And God hates suffering and pain and death. And finally, he's going to pull the plug. Notice what it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 13. There's a lot more about this we're going to look at in another session. But notice it says, Nevertheless, we, those who believe in Jesus, those who who have had the second birth, says we, according to his promise, these promises that we've been finding in the Scripture, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we're looking for is that place where we don't have any more of this mess that we live in now. No more pain and divorce and death and disease and all these things we suffer through. It's coming to an end. And so Jesus wants to share eternity with us. He wants to share the beauties and the the pleasures of earth made new with you and I and with everyone who will accept Him. And God eventually will mercifully eradicate the wicked, including Satan and those wicked angels as well. And because of what Jesus has done for us, remember we see, we keep seeing night after night, and I should have put a slide up for this, how there's only going to be two sides. There's only, there's only been two sides since the beginning. You've been on Jesus, they've been on Jesus' side, or they've been on Lucifer's side. That's the only option. There is no fence riding. If you're on a fence, you're on the devil's side. That's just the bottom line. And so but there's coming a day, though, where there'll be no more fence riding because of what Jesus has done for us. We've got to decide, I want to be a part of that group. I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. I'm going to give my life 
to Jesus. And when you do, he gives you different goals, a different, different way of thinking. He, he makes you into a, a new creature. He begins to plant his word into your heart, his laws we saw the other night, into our hearts. So my question is, are you following Jesus all the way? Are you sold out to Jesus? Have you truly surrendered your life to him? Maybe you need to think about a deeper commitment. Um, you know, we, I haven't pressed one single time, and I'm not going to press it tonight, of you, anybody becoming a member of this church or my church. But we're going to have a baptism, not tomorrow, but next Saturday morning. If you think the Lord's been speaking to your heart and you want to be a part of that and you'd like to talk to me and Pastor Stanley tomorrow night, or let me know tonight, or we'll, we'll, we'll have the schedule out tomorrow night. You can arrange a time to meet with us if you'd like to. But in the meantime... I'm looking forward to when, this, this, when God makes everything right, when God destroys all wickedness, and we don't have to live like we're living now. I'm looking forward to living with Jesus forever. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you that you have made a way, in spite of all Satan and the host of evil angels' efforts, to, you've made a way for us to be in heaven. And Lord, ultimately, the choice belongs to us. And so I just pray that on each, each one of our hearts, Lord, you'll write your law, that we'll experience your love, we'll sense your, your presence, your Holy Spirit's prompting us and, and, and trying to guide us to a different path. And Lord, I, can't, I don't know what that path might be, but I know it's following you. And so I just pray, Lord, that, that every one of us will, will experience um, the call from you, that you would have us, to, the, the, the walk you would have us to walk. And so... Bless us to that end, Lord. Please forgive us of our sins and go with us now as we separate. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.